Vogel's childhood farm is in rural Virginia, where his family raised dairy cattle and milked cows. My dad and mother moved here in 1943 when I was nine years old. And during that time, we had a dairy of about somewhere between 20 and 30 cows, which in those days was a modest, medium-sized dairy. At the time, milk was believed to be nature's perfect food. So perfect, in fact, that this U.S. government film from the early 20th century recommended that infants who have just been weaned from their mother's milk should be switched immediately to cow's milk. That was the excitement of doing something, producing nature's perfect food, if you will. Hello, my name is T. Colin Campbell. I'm a professor emeritus of nutritional biochemistry at Cornell University. Uh, I've been in the business of uh, the science of nutrition for a long time and uh, learned some very exciting things. And, and the essence of his idea is that we have enormous control over our health uh, merely by what we choose to eat. Please welcome Dr. Colin Campbell. Doc! What a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Campbell. But what makes the work that you learned about in China so important, so revolutionary with that regard? Well, my work actually started many years ago in, uh, in the laboratory. And one of the first things that we did that I found very exciting, we, we could turn on and turn off the development of cancer, the progression of cancer. The vast majority of the people in the public are really quite confused about this topic of nutrition, which is pretty sad because now we know that nutrition ought to be the premier biomedical science of the future. America is suffering from diet-related illnesses. I had certain ideas that everyone else had, that the good old American diet is as good as it gets. Well, we got into science, I started doing things, fantastic things, very exciting opportunities over the years. I learned that what I thought was true in the beginning is not true. Focusing on plant-based diets, he documented his research in the best-selling 2005 book, The China Study, co-written with his son and medical doctor, Thomas M. Campbell. The most comprehensive study ever done of the relationship between diet and disease. And so the China Study was really an opportunity in a human setting to see if what we were learning in the laboratory had any bearing for a human population. Um, I uh, have been at this for more than six decades and learned some exciting things as far as what nutrition can do with health. It's uh, the nutrition I'm talking about uh, concerns the consumption of whole plant-based foods, vegetables, fruits, grains, uh, legumes, uh, and uh, so forth. And uh, when, when nutrition is given in that form, it does have a remarkable effect on our health. Now, in the present day, in the present day with this problem that we have, it turns out that I was able to recall some data we got in China over 30 years ago, having to do with not only the effect of this nutrition on so-called chronic degenerative diseases, which is basically the, the, the discussion we're having in this community, like heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and so forth, but the data we got from China at that time actually also included some information on the virus diseases as well. And we learned something there that uh, I'm going to say that what that suggested was that the impressive effect of this diet on chronic degenerative diseases also applies to the viral diseases like COVID-19. A pattern was beginning to emerge. Nutrients from animal-based foods increased tumor development, while nutrients from plant-based foods decreased tumor development. The researchers also looked at casein, a protein that makes up 87% of cow milk protein. It was found that high doses of casein could turn on cancer genes, but low or no levels turn them off. Cow's milk protein, casein, is a chemical carcinogen that is more relevant than any other carcinogen identified so far. Saying that those who consume the most dairy have up to double or quadruple the risk. Among these individual observations, though, there's a whole series of them that we've now considered. 
And that is to say that the higher the fat intake, the higher the breast cancer risk. Uh, the lower the fiber intake, the higher the, the cancer risk for colon cancer and rectal cancer. The really important thing in my view is animal protein. And that's a story that's been ignored for more than 100 years. Way back when, when they were first studying the question concerning factors of diet that cause atherosclerosis, for example, they were at that time discussing, was it the fatty or lipid part of the diet, or maybe it was a protein. They made a conclusion in the 1920s, serious researchers did, it was more about animal protein than it was about cholesterol or fat. Now we have information that is really fantastic for the public to know. And they're not really getting a good opportunity to know that. And I'm talking about the whole food plant-based diet. There are virtually no nutrients in animal-based foods that are not better provided by plants. So in November of 2011, my dad and Dr. Esselstyn, his colleague, were invited to speak to the legislature from the floor of the Kentucky House. And Kentucky has some of the worst health statistics in the nation. The, the topic that I really want to share with you, it really has to do with the way we think about nutrition. I found this staggering. My dad's and Dr. Esselstyn's talks that day were historic. Never before had the idea of plant-based nutrition been presented from the floor of a state legislature. So there you have it. Thank you very much for your time. In the mid-1960s, Dr. Campbell was in the Philippines, trying to get more protein to millions of malnourished children. To keep costs down, he and his colleagues decided not to use animal-based protein. The program was beginning to show success. But then Dr. Campbell stumbled onto a piece of information that was extremely important. It centered on the more affluent families in the Philippines, who were eating relatively high amounts of animal-based foods. But at the same time, they were the ones most likely to have the children who were susceptible to getting liver cancer. This was very unusual since liver cancers are mainly found in adults. But just the mere fact that they occurred in children said, you know, there's something here, this is pretty significant. By 1975, Dr. Campbell was at Cornell University investigating what he discovered in the Philippines. Our work from the beginning was designed, to, in a sense, to do two main things. One, I wanted to replicate, if possible, the Indian work because it was so provocative. Secondly, if this is really true, I wanted to study how does it work. But Dr. Campbell decided to take these findings a step further. This time, instead of keeping his test rats on the same diet throughout the study, he kept them in one group and switched their diets back and forth between 5 and 20% dairy protein, doing so at three-week intervals. The results were astonishing. Whenever the rats were fed 20% protein, early liver tumor growth exploded. But when the same rats were given 5% protein, tumor growth actually went down. I mean, this was so provocative, this information. We could turn on and turn off cancer growth just by adjusting the level of intake of that protein. Growth from 5% to 20% is within the range of American experience. The typical studies on chemical carcinogens causing cancer are testing chemicals at levels maybe three or four orders of magnitude higher than we experience. Even more surprisingly, Dr. Campbell discovered that a 20% diet of plant proteins from soybeans and wheat did not promote cancer. Fruits, it's uh, virtually impossible to be protein deficient without being calorie deficient because even if you take the foods that are the, have the least amount of protein in it, let's say potatoes, for example, or rice, you know, eight, nine percent. Well, isn't that, that's the figure we more or less need. Dr. Campbell's research led him to a conclusion about the way genes, chemicals, and nutrition interact to promote cancer. Cancer starts with genes. It might be genes we're born with. It might be genes that are actually changed by a chemical. So 
those genes become capable of producing cancer cells. Whether we do or don't get cancer is primarily related to how we promote those cancer cells to grow over time. That's where nutrition comes into play. They go much more rapidly when they were fed animal protein. Dr. Campbell and other nutritional scientists have found that only a small percentage of cancer cases are caused solely by genes. I think the general consensus in my field is that probably not more than one or two percent at most is attributed to the genes we may or may not have. 1990, following nearly a decade of intense effort, Dr. Campbell and his colleagues finally published their China study. It identified no less than 94,000 correlations between diet and disease. Those are big numbers for any study. And in the end of the day, when we did all these correlations in this book here, and we looked at the number of them that were statistically significant, it was between about eight to 9,000. When you have that large number of correlations and you start analyzing each one, if it works out as statistically significant, this means that if 19 out of 20 are pointing in the same direction, is highly significant and likely to be true. Hundreds of detailed tables and charts were included in the study. Each one presented the raw data that was collected. Then, this information was cross-referenced in multiple ways to demonstrate its reliability and to show how it linked with the 367 variables the study examined. I think the major message we got out of all these coloration analysis uh, is only one message. The plant food-based diet, mainly cereal grains, vegetables, and the fruits, and the very little animal food is always associated with lower mortality of certain cancers, stroke, and the coronary heart disease. The New York Times called it the most comprehensive large study ever undertaken of the relationship between diet and the risk of developing disease. For Dr. Campbell, he finally had large-scale data on people, and it was remarkably consistent with his earlier discoveries. Together, he found that the scientific evidence was clear. Whole plant-based foods were beneficial to human health, while animal-based foods were not.